So welcome everyone to our second session of our election day program. Uh, if this is the first session you're joining today, thank you for participating. Our next speaker is Dr. Wendy Lauer, who will give historical context on the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. Dr. Lauer is the direct director of the McGrubelian Center for Human Rights and John K. Roth Professor of History at Claremont McKenna College. She's the author of several publications, including her book, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and has been translated into 23 languages. Her recent book, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre Revealed, was published in February, 2021. Dr. Lauer will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes. And after that, we will take questions from participants. So you can put any questions you do have in the chat and we'll address those afterwards. So I am honored to welcome Dr. Lauer. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, fellow teachers. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. I know this is a election day and you could, could be doing other things. I also heard that you had a program this morning on the artwork of Lurie um, and the new exhibit that just opened at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So um, congratulations to the museum and, and to all of you for taking the time out today to learn more about the Holocaust. I know you could be doing other things, so I really appreciate that you're here. You're here. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview to give you some context um, for what we talk about today as the um, kind of Holocaust by bullets. What happened in Eastern Europe um, during the war, because the Holocaust occurred in Eastern Europe during the Second World War, and there's a relationship between the two that we're going to look at. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Hitler ideology that's driving the Nazi ideology that's driving this, this mass violence in this war. Um, and then I'm going to give you some highlights, some themes related to this history as far as resistance and collaboration and the bystanders. Um, how did the local population respond? How did it end? Um, did it end? Uh, so um, if you'll just bear with me right now, I'm going to share my screen because um, it helps, I think, to show you some of the geography and some of the visuals um, and some of the, um, some of the basic terms that we want to um, be familiar with in this history. So let's, let's get going. Um, and I will speak um, for a little while, for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes. Please, as Molly mentioned, put your questions in the chat. Um, so we can have time for Q and A at the end. I'm really interested to hear what you what you've learned and what you want to learn more about. So the first thing to um, deal with in this history, I think, is important with your students is to think about the Holocaust as deriving from a real plan, a real state kind of ideology, an ideology that combines racism, scientific racism, um, uh, space. In this case coveting kind of space, imperial expansion, um, an enemy, in this case, the Jews, the anti-Semitism, which had a racial component to it. So it was a kind of biological anti-Semitism um, and, and the notion of empire. Um, Hitler, uh, in his mindset and his followers, really believed that Germany had been denied its kind of place in the sun. Um, that it had been denied its grand empire along the model of what the British had. Um, but actually they looked very closely, Hitler looked very closely. If you read Mein Kampf and you read his speeches, he makes a lot of references to the American, North American approach to empire, continental expansion, a notion of kind of manifest destiny, that it is Germany's fate for their own survival as a race to look to the East, to expand to the East, to the breadbasket of um, Ukraine, for instance, to the riches of, of, of the, the soil, the dark soil, um, the timber and the grain, the breadbasket. So what happened was in the First World War, um, Hitler and the Germans had lost, the Kaiser had lost, the Kaiser had fled and their empire had collapsed. Um, that was an overseas empire. During the Second World War, Hitler was going to win this time with, an, with a continental empire that was going to expand, you know, looking eastward from Germany to Poland, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Belarusia, and, and the, the jewel in his eyes was, um, was actually Ukraine as far as the agricultural benefits of that. The Germans had starved during the First World War and he was not gonna let that happen again. He was incredibly explicit. Hitler was very explicit about this campaign um, on the eve of the war, was um, speaking with um, uh, the head of the League of Nations and 
the foreign minister was speaking to Churchill about it. There was, there was no secret about what their intentions were, which is also something to think about. It was um, very much an open um, endeavor. Now this plan for colonization, and here we have, um, and, and to think about the relationship between like genocide and colonialism, um, when, a, when a power moves, moves into, a, uh, occupies and colonizes um, a space, in this case, a territory, what happens to the local population in that space? Um, the Germans refer to this big plan for Eastern Europe as the general plan East and Hitler's uh, right-hand man, the head of the whole terror apparatus, Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer SS, he was um, charged with the implementation of this plan. And this was a massive plan of, of genocide, um, starting with the uh, annihilation of the Jews, where they were estimating 20, 30 million so-called Slavs, Poles, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Latvians, they called them untermenschen, they called them inferior peoples, they had a whole hierarchy of race, that they were supposed to just disappear over the decades. So this entire German utopia was based on this genocide, on this dystopia. Here are some rare images of the German attempt in Ukraine, and there's the SS flag flying over this experimental colony. You can see there, German colony, and you see these Hitler youth, these women, girls and boys, and here's just the, the, the space is kind of marked out here and there's an SS flag. These were the little colonial kind of strongholds that they were setting up in Eastern Europe. A lot of people don't realize how far they went um, in the pursuit of this, what they thought was this Aryan only utopia. But the thing is that this plan for colonizing Eastern Europe, and here's a map showing um, during the war, how far the Nazis got, that black line is the extent of the German military um, advance. So here's Germany proper, and they moved eastward here across these areas, Belarusia, Latvia, Estonia, Hungary, Romania. They're moving to take over all this living space. But it, it is the space itself is exactly where Jewish life thrived during at really as of the 18th century, and in some cases much earlier, going back to the 16th century, we have in this same space of Eastern Europe, the Jewish Pale of Settlement. The Russian Empire had set up a kind of reservation, a space for Jews only. They were restricting them um, to these um, villages and towns, these shtetls um, in places like Ukraine and, and all these towns I have marked out here. And in many of these places, the Jewish population the, was rather high. The density could be 30 to 50 percent of that town was um, uh, occupied by, by Jews. And think of Fiddler on the Roof and some of these um, uh, stories and um, images you might have of, of Jewish life kind of before the Holocaust. So the Nazi plan is to colonize that space to eliminate all Jews from that space because they see them as the arch enemy, whether biologically as potentially um, infecting Germans and, and, um, and um, weakening the German, the Aryan race, um, or politically, they believe that the Jews were the um, kind of incubators that they were um, pushing the Bolshevik revolution, the communist revolution, that they were radicals. Um, and a lot of other anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish tropes and ideas that carried over from centuries, um, whether Christians had um, blamed the Jews for um, being Christ killers. So all these ideas, anti-Jewish um, ideas were kind of wrapped up into um, this Nazi ideology and pre-existing in those local populations. So Ukrainians, Poles, Polish anti-Semitism. So the Germans are entering into a terrain that is already uh, has a very deep history of violent anti-Semitism and a history of pogroms. This is a term that means kind of riots or, or popular violence. I'm gonna show you some photos of that. Um, but that story of pogroms resides right in these spaces where the Nazis are going to enter into. So the Nazis launched this big campaign in the summer of 1941 called Operation Barbarossa. And in their terms, they called it a war of destruction. They were very self-conscious of it. It was called in German, the Vernichtungskrieg, but all you need to, you don't need to know that German term. You just need to know that the Germans, again, going into this campaign already um, were determined to not only conduct it militarily um, in a conventional way, but to turn into the kind of occupied zones into the civilian zones and seek a total destruction of 
of any kind of civilian enemies and, and um, starting with the Jewish population. And they also uh, went after the Soviet POWs, um, about 3 million um, Russian soldiers who were captured during the first uh, year of the war were actually killed, um, detained in camps, um, kind of abandoned in those camps, and they were had to resort to cannibalism. They starved to death. They were shot. Um, so they, uh, in this campaign already, we see massive um, crimes, war crimes against the the uh, Russian soldiers, um, as well at the same time um, the civilians in the uh, occupied territories. So who carried out these for this kind of wave of massacres of mass shootings, so-called Holocaust by bullets? Well, the spearheading forces that started this, so right on the heels, sometimes along with the German military, the German military, the Wehrmacht, um, which launches campaign on June 22nd, 1941, and they moved eastward. You can see these arrows. Um, there were three army groups that went um, pushed eastward, about three million men strong. It was one of the, it was the largest at the time, the largest land and air invasion, um, single air invasion. And the Nazis came in, Hitler came in with not only his army, but he had his allies, the Axis forces. They were joined by Romanian, um, Hungarian, and Croatian um, forces. So it was a massive military campaign. And right on the heels of that, Himmler, the Reichsführer SS, had deployed his special action task forces, so-called Einsatzgruppen. And that just means Einsatz is kind of a, a task and group and group. So task groups, action forces. And they are um, SS and police, they're security officials, um, elite security officials, highly educated actually. Most of the Einsatzgruppen members had higher degrees. Many of them had degrees in law, um, coming from different professions. It was a priest among them. There was an opera singer among them. So they are highly civilized um, elite forces that go in in these four groups, A, B, C, D. There are about a thousand each um, in these groups. And then they break up into so-called like subunits and they are moving into these small communities and scouring and looking. I mean, they, they even, they have maps where they have figured out before the invasion down to 30 Jews or less, they know exactly where these Jews reside and they go to the victims in their motorized, on their motorcycles, on their horseback, on their bicycles, and they go to these towns um, and they start to, and it's a rapid action. They start to round up the Jews. They start with the men because they see them as the most threatening. Um, um, and they um, bring them to the edge of their, or their own hometowns or villages, and they start to conduct these, these mass shootings from the very beginning of the campaign. This is what it looks like, and this is all from the time. These are German documents, uh, photographs, very important, that were discovered on German soldiers. This one's very famous. Uh, this is an Einsatzgruppen special unit shooter, executioner, killing this Jewish woman and her child. Actually, it's an entire family. This has been cropped here. Um, you can see the rest of the family is kind of running in this direction on this field, the killing fields um, of, of the Holocaust, the Holocaust by bullets. In fact, when you think about the Holocaust, often, you know, your students, um, you, you may think of the gas chambers at Auschwitz-Birkenau, at Treblinka, these killing centers where the victims were deported to the sites and then asphyxiated or, or gassed at those sites. And like half of the victims of the Holocaust, rough estimate, died when they were deported and killed immediately in these gassing facilities. But another large number, almost half, but perhaps not quite, but significant number of the Jews who died in the Holocaust did not go to the gassing centers, were not tattooed um, and, 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 and names placed on lists on train um, uh, uh, as cargo, used, shipped as cargo. Instead, they were just put kind of brought to the edge of their town and shot, as I mentioned. And that means that we have numbers, like you see the numbers on these reports. We don't have lists of names. We don't have lists of, of family units. They, those lists were kind of created after the war. The Germans didn't bother to register. They, they just wanted to wipe out these communities. They started with the men. And then within a matter of weeks, within about a month, 
they started to expand the killing to women and children. And this was a very important moment in the history of the Holocaust, the summer of 1941, when they start to expand to entire communities. Um, that's when scholars start to look at the decision-making that occurred around that. Was there any resistance to that expansion um, legally or morally? How did that happen so quickly? And it, when you go into that history almost day by day, you do discover some really interesting phenomenon as far as those who embrace that so-called opportunity to, to really go forth and, and, and pursue genocide um, um, because it had been ordered, because Himmler and Hitler were pressuring their subordinates to do that. And then some who had some misgivings and how those misgivings were overcome. So it's, those are interesting questions that we can talk about as far as that, that historic moment, that fateful moment. But it really occurs between July 41 and October 41. The mass shootings, the expansion to women and children, the introduction of now experimentation with gas vans in these, um, in these open terrains, in these um, uh, in, in cities. Um, and then how that um, use of, of gas, because the Nazis realized they couldn't shoot all the Jews of Europe, right? Once, they, once Hitler says in the summer of 41 to actually his Croatian ally, no Jewish family is to be left on the continent of Europe no Jewish family, the, if any descendants survive, they will come back and avenge their loved ones. And we are going to pursue something total and final. So at that moment, when they're carrying out these mass shootings, the leaders also realize, and Himmler himself actually goes and witnesses a mass shooting in Minsk in August, 1941, and says, I cannot subject my men to this. This is, this is, this is chaos. This is too upsetting for them. They're having nervous breakdowns. Um, we need to find a cleaner method. And that's when the escalation then turns to the use of gas and that's experimented with and at Auschwitz-Birkenau and the first gassing centers, the architects come in, they find the location at Belzec, they start to construct them. So these things are happening rapidly and simultaneously and it's happening during this military campaign. And the Germans are doing this in a, as Chris Browning says, in this euphoria of victory. They're emboldened. They have, I showed you that map, they are advancing towards Moscow. They're going to win their Lebensraum. They're going to win their territory. And this is what's pushing, what's driving um, the escalation of the violence from the top down, in the field. And, and guess what? Local inhabitants, we're going to look at some images in a moment, Ukrainians, Latvians, Lithuanians, the, they come forth and they participate, they collaborate. They're, the Germans are not getting any resistance on the ground either. So these things are pushing this um, process forward um, and it's um, absolutely devastating. And it's at the end of Jewish life in Eastern Europe is beginning at this moment. So here we have um, German a photograph from Ukraine. This is a very famous image um, from, that was a German report here, they're, they're reporting from the field back to the leadership in Berlin about how good a job they're doing, um, how successful they are in making their territories free of Jews, Juden Fi. This is Einsatzgruppe A that went through the Northern Baltic regions. There's Riga you learned about today. Um, and there's Kovno, Lithuania, Belarus, Minsk, into Russia, Estonia. This is the number of Jews per, that they have killed um, in the population, you see the precision of the of the of the numbers of the of the bookkeeping, as it were, in the most horrific way. And this this German chief of Einsatzgruppe A, um, not only is listing in his radio; these are telegrams going back. Einsatzgruppe A. He's based in Riga. This guy's name is Jaeger. He's an SS officer. He's reporting back. Um, and this is actions from December 1941. I show this image to my students because you can see the thoroughness, but you can also see the different victim groups and the fact that the Jews are, are overwhelming majority of those killed. And this report basically says, lists the victims, um, and there's a translation on the bottom of it too, pardon me. Um, um, Poles who were killed, mentally and physically disabled, 653 persons, partisans, um, and here's the number for Jews killed, 136, 421. This is just in the first couple months of the campaign. 
Um, and then there's a breakdown. Um, this, this man is, is so uh, diligent, he breaks down the total sum. Um, so out of the 138,272 victims who are mass murdered in the first couple of months here by this one small unit um, of killers, within that he tells us right down here, 55,556 of them are women and 34,464 of them are children. So that explicit about what's going on. And then the attachment to that photograph, to that, to these reports is this image. This, this, these killers went so far as to create this map um, to show their superiors and include these images of these coffins to provide that visual aid. That's the thinking behind this, as they, this mass murder. And as they're doing this systematic campaign in the local population is kind of drawing from its own history of anti-Jewish violence are these so-called pogroms, these um, massacres, these riots um, that involve the local population. Now they're going into the Jewish quarters of cities. This, these are photos from Lviv, Laval, Blemberg, Western Ukraine. Also massive pogroms in the town of Kovno. These are seven to 8,000 Jews killed in Kovno, 6,000 killed at the end of July in, in Lviv, Lviv, Lviv. So they're killing these Jews kind of openly on the streets while the Germans are actually bringing out Jews and shooting them at the edge of town. So it's a combination of a, a military, so-called military security operation and lo local um, popular um, violence. Probably the most um, uh, famous of these mass murders that were part of this history of the Holocaust by bullets um, occurred at Babi Yar uh, in Ukraine and was recently, um, the 80th anniversary was just commemorated. There's a new memorial that's opening up in Babi Yar that's very interesting, we can talk about as well. Um, but here we have uh, an image of the city of Babi Yar. I have, I'm showing here just in terms of the proximity of this large ravine at the edge of of the city, the outskirts of the city. So the Germans put nature to work. They're taking these, they're taking the rivers and the swamps and the large um, gorges and the natural beautiful landscape and they're turning them into killing sites. They're letting, you know, they're, they're bringing these, in this case, almost over 30,000 Jews in the urban population of Kiev who were ordered here. Jews must report by 8 a.m. on September 29th to this street corner and they're being marched. If they don't follow this order, they're gonna be shot. And then they're warning the civilians who wanna plunder because there's a lot of um, incentive on the part of the local population um, to go after Jewish property, um, that they will also be shot if they violate that. Note that they're not talking about, you know, any civilians who harm Jews will be punished. It's all about uh, the competition for, for Jewish property and Jewish personal belongings. And here is the order that was issued in um, um, Ukrainian and Russian to the local population. And these Jews over two days are brought out to this ravine. You can see the landscape. And this is um, also an image to show you just the magnitude of the, of the mass murder. Um, 30,000, uh, up to 50,000, these would continue these shootings um, into October 41. And these are the officials, the German policemen kind of sorting through all the Jewish um, belongings and their clothing. And they've been shot, um, uh, so-called sardine method um, in this ravine. And later on, the Germans are gonna try to cover this up um, and dynamite the walls of this ravine and cover up this entire, uh, 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 hole here in the landscape and, and try to conceal their crimes. Um, and this is an interesting story as far as what happened to the site after the war. And I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. So I've been trying to stress that this is part of a, a Nazi plan, Nazi ideology, Nazi decision-making among the leadership. Um, and that this is a dynamic between kind of what's going on in the headquarters in Berlin and their idea of the future and a general plan Ost and then things on the ground coming together. And here's Adolf Hitler himself, who's kind of touring the area. Um, and he's in this town of Berdichev, Ukraine in August 41. And the Jews at this, this is one of the largest population of Jews in this town and they're being ghettoized. And within about a month, they're all gonna be shot. 
at, a, at the low on the local airfield at the edge of town. But here's Hitler being, you know, jubilantly greeted. This this gentleman's taking film clips. There's a Sikh Heil. He's got his hand up. And then these women are here. These nurses are here. They're right there on the scene. Women were also part of this campaign. Almost a half a million women were um, brought into the uh, uh, occupation zones as nurses and welfare workers and secretaries. Here we have Himmler himself and his his uh, leadership here. They just took a plane and they've landed here in, in Estonia. And they're also going on the ground and surveying and observing what's going on. And there's Himmler in, um, also um, touring what's going on. So it's very much a, uh, a Nazi policy. This is not Keystone Cops. This is not, you know, that the Nazis invaded and then suddenly in the in the um, heat of war, these kinds of, uh, this violence erupted. This is a combination of a, of a state plan and of local participants. Um, I've been working on this photograph for uh, several years actually. And it's, um, you know, rather very, this all very disturbing history to study, especially the sources, because the imagery can be um, incredibly um, painful and incredibly hard to uh, look at. And that's that's something that I know is going to be a challenge when you get into the classroom with your students. Um, uh, and, you know, I'd be happy to answer some of your questions about pedagogical strategies um, in, that, in that regard. I uh, do use photographs and I also use um, documents. Um, uh, to try to get at some of the really important um, issues surrounding this history. Um, two of them are uh, the issues of collaboration and resistance. So, you know, thinking about if you were at one of these scenes, you know, what could you have done if you were Jewish or if you were Ukrainian or if you were a German soldier and how would you have responded? And, you know, was resistance even possible given this over, overwhelming assault on these communities and the speed in which the Nazis occupied um, these communities and, and rounded up, up the Jews and carried these actions out. Here's a photograph from um, Ukraine uh, in 1941, October from Mirapol that's, I think encapsulates a lot of this history. You, you see a Jewish family at the center of it. Um, and what about the fate of families? And remember Hitler's quote about not wanting any family to survive. And how does a family experience this history um, and how Jews had to make so many decisions around um, their sense of family, who should flee, who should go into hiding? Um, how can one, you know, how can a father protect a daughter in the face of uh, pogromists who, as you saw in that photo, that woman whose, whose clothing was torn off, that the um, prevalence of, of sexual violence and rape that's going on and, um, and how to protect the children um, uh, uh, from the information, from to find them hiding places and negotiate that with people in the local community. Uh, so these were all, you know, fateful decisions. Um, and sadly, in places like Ukraine, the survival rate was so low, like 2%. This massacre here that you're looking at, uh, one person survived that, that massacre from that, from that town. Um, and what, what happens to that um, survivor who, who comes out of the war orphaned um, in that way? And the, in this picture too, we also see um, this is happening in broad daylight. And here's again, the use of the landscape. Um, this, they're being shot at this, the edge of this Pit. And what does that mean for the local population? This is their hometown too. And these mass graves are there to this day. I visited this mass grave. The, the, the bones are still, you know, discoverable. Um, and it's part of a, of a local park. Um, and the, the men in this photo, the way they're clustered together, the German officials with their caps shoulder to shoulder with these Ukrainian um, auxiliaries. They don't speak the same language. These Germans have just arrived on the scene. There's a, a man in the background kind of helping out an onlooker. Um, and they're, they're, they're carrying out this, this act together, um, this anti-Semitic violence. Um, and then at the foreground in that picture, you see those, those shoes and, um, and that crumpled coat. And to think about the victim who was killed before this family. Was it the father? And who was that person? Um, and around that victim's shoes, the shoes that we see so often as part of our memorial culture, um, representing the, the absence and the loss and that, that 
presence of absence, basically. And then the bullet casings around below those shoes, the litter, the litter of mass murder. We know about this, this particular event because the photographer survived. The photographer was a Slovakian official, um, part of the collaborationist uh, regime of Slovakians that joined the Germans in the invasion. And here in the Slovakian document, um, the photographer is testifying about what happened. And in this case, the photographer um, uh, is taking this picture, actually a series of pictures of this massacre as a visual testimony. While he's standing there openly taking the picture in a Slovakian uniform and to the Jewish victims who are being killed, clearly a collaborator, a threat. Um, in fact, he's actually taking these pictures um, because he's part of the resistance. And this is going to be his visual narrative of what happened. And this is his penultimate you know, enough moment. He's going to leave the military campaign. He's going to share these photos with Jews in his community back home in Slovakia and warn them not to, to answer the calls to deportations, not to um, follow the, the orders to go east because this is what will, uh, this is what awaits you and your, and your family members. And so collaboration takes on different forms. We have um, uh, this gentleman who was the photographer was sent into that campaign because of his, the Slovakian leader, Father Tizo. Um, we also have in Romania, the uh, head of Romania, um, Antonescu. We have the most famous collaborator, the Quisling of Europe um, in Norway. So we have leadership um, you know, together with Hitler, not only planning, Operation Barbarossa, Barbarossa not only um, uh, fighting together with him to try to defeat Bolshevism and communism in Europe, but also participating in the Holocaust, collaborating with Hitler on the annihilation of the Jews. They too want to remove Jews from their countries and make them free of Jews and are following a kind of racial um, uh, imperial plan uh, for Europe. And Tonescu's rounding up Jews in, um, in Odessa, um, and carrying out uh, mass murders. Father Tizo is sending his forces in with Hitler to participate in the killings in Ukraine. He's also gonna be the first to organize deportations of Jews to Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, including a woman I worked with very closely in New York, Heather, uh, uh, Helen Tischauer was the first, was a Jewish Slovakian woman who arrived in Birkenau in March, 1942, and was there till the end. We also have collaboration um, in the form of these uh, uh, kind of administrators, because this is um, not, these are open air mass shootings, but they are organized and require, uh, uh, you know, squads to be organized and bullets to be distributed um, uh, and, and clothes to be redistributed to the local population. And then we have these kind of local thugs, uh, the policemen you saw in the photograph uh, who are pulled out of POW camps, capture POWs and um, deployed as so-called Travniki guards. There's Ivan Damyanyuk in this photograph. He was a Ukrainian who ended up in, um, in the United States um, in Ohio and was deported ultimately back to Germany and stood trial um, uh, about a decade ago and ended up dying in Germany. He was convicted. He was a guard at Sobibor. The photographer that um, took that picture that we were looking at from Mirapol, here he is. I just wanted to show you what he looked like during the war and this was taken in that town. Um, and here he is with his wife because the two of them ended up um, uh, together um, collaborating in the best sense of the word as resistance fighters. And they're using these photographs. And I know you saw some images, um, some of you saw some images that Lurie, the survivor created, his visual testimony, his artistic kind of visual memory of bearing witness. And for this photographer, those, that photograph I showed you was his attempt um, to scream to the world what was happening and to resist it. And there he is, the photographer after the war, and there's his camera that was donated to the Museum of the History of Jews in Bratislava. So this kind of resistance was possible. And Jews themselves also organized resistance movements um, and pursued various survival strategies. Um, about 10,000 Jews in these fighting units and in these family camps. The most famous was um, Abba Kovner's resistance um, 
uh, movement in the Kovno ghetto in Lithuania. And here they are, here's Abba Kovno and his group, mostly young, you can see there he's in the center. He would survive the war and actually testify at the Eichmann trial. Um, who declared as this was happening at the end of 1941, we will not go like sheep to the slaughter. We have to rise up. We have to fight, fight um, um, to the death. Um, and the Warsaw Ghetto probably in 1943, the most famous act of armed resistance. Um, but sadly, this was, it, it's, these are um, very important for the history of, uh, of Jews and for the history of genocide that kind of resolve and that kind of organization. Remember, the Jews are an incredibly diverse community in Eastern Europe, speaking different languages, um, whether it's Yiddish or, or they're assimilated, they have different political views. Some, in some cases, if you saw in Riga, we have German Jews being deported um, to places like Minsk and Tokovno and Riga, and they're intermixing with in, in the ghettos and they're in different parts of the ghetto. So it's a very diverse community. Just to organize this resistance was monumental, but also to do it under the assault of the German um, uh, campaign and the ghettoization. And these Jews had lost their family members and um, uh, you know that in, in many ways um, gave them that, that fighting spirit, but it was also the grief that they were uh, enduring at the same time, let alone um, starvation level rations. And I mean, so to think about resistance and what was possible under these circumstances, I think is important and not to assume that it, that it was possible and, and why didn't they, uh, why couldn't they stop this? Um, well, the rest of the world didn't wanna stop it. Um, so they were really uh, on their own. There was very little resistance organized, really no organized sustained resistance to help the Jews as this information was coming out and was coming out almost at the same time it was happening. Um, intelligence reports were, were, were coming out and German reports like the ones I showed you were being intercepted by, by the British. Um, so this was um, becoming uh, uh, well known, certainly by the spring of 42, um, uh, um, there, were, uh, there was good coverage um, in the governments internally and externally in the press. Um, another form of resistance here, we see the milk can, um, Emanuel Ringelblum was an historian um, in the Warsaw Ghetto and some uh, could imagine that Jews would not be left to, to bear witness and, um, and then fear, uh, feverishly gathered um, as much documentation um, among like, teachers and intellectuals and theologians um, and rabbis would gather secretly on, um, on Saturday and the Sabbath and, and um, bring together as much material as they could into this time capsule and place them in these containers, in this case, a milk can, um, because um, uh, as a diarist um, wrote, a Kaplan, a famous diarist in, in the Warsaw Ghetto who actually died in Treblinka, you know, what will happen to us when we're all gone? Uh, what will be left of our lives? If my diary doesn't survive, then or if I don't survive, then at least my diary will survive. Um, so they already saw the cultural destruction, the physical destruction, and they wanted there to be some remnant um, of, their, of their civilization um, to remain. And so they collected this information, like children's essays and photographs. And, um, and these are really beautiful archives, collections of of what was Jewish civilization. And this is what historians study and this is what um, you can teach with. It's really valuable. So how did it end? Well, it ended, um, uh, the Holocaust ended when the war ended. I mean, it really took a kind of military defeat um, to, to make this stop, to shut down the gas chambers. Um, um, but, uh, you know, prior to that, the Nazis, as the campaigns and military defeat started, with the um, Stalingrad um, in 1943 um, and this renewed offensives in the summer of 43. And so Hitler's armies are being pushed back into Germany. Um, and this is when the ghetto liquidations begin um, and then the shutdown of the concentration camps. Um, one of the longest um, existing ghettos, the Kovno ghetto, um, is converted into kind of a concentration camp. And then all of that is shut down in 1944. And this kind of, as the regime is kind of closing into Germany proper, because the Americans and, and the British are coming in from Normandy, the Red Army is coming in from um, uh, advancing from the east, 
Um, and then the Jewish victims are being forced onto these death marches. Um, and those who survive end up in Germany proper, about a quarter of a million. And they come out of hiding. Um, uh, and the Red Armies are coming in, they're kind of liberating, um, uh, finding Majdanek, finding the camps, um, finding what's left of these remnant communities. Um, but it's not over for, for the Jews. Um, uh, those who make it to the displaced person camps in Germany, um, uh, who are then kind of protecting these camps, especially in the US zone, um, trying to restore their lives, engaging in a lot of um, you know, quick marriages and, 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 and um, birth rates are, are skyrocketing right after the war and also searching for the missing, trying to find out what happened to their loved ones. Um, also uh, coming forward and speaking to the authorities, people like Simon Wiesenthal immediately bringing documents to the Americans and my photographer I showed you, he's bringing his photos to uh, trying to get them to the Americans. This is what happened, um, seeking some sort of justice um, and revenge. Um, and then flight, um, Jews realizing that, that Europe basically is no longer home. Uh, when they go back to Poland, when they go back to their hometowns in Ukraine, when they go back um, to, to Riga, they're not wanted. Um, in some cases, pogroms occur. Um, in some cases, when Jews emerge from hiding and the Red Army um, confronts them after they've been in these bunkers and they've been living in caves and holes and on the run for years, the Red Army officials, the Soviet Army says, you Jews, what, why, what, how did you survive? I, I thought all the Germans killed, killed the Jews. If you survived, you must have been a collaborator. And then they're rounded up again. And so many of these Jews are facing um, continued persecution, even violence when they go back to their hometowns. The people who are occupying their apartments and have taken their uh, armoires and all of their property, they don't want to give it back. And so we have massive immigration of, of Jews either to Palestine, to Canada, to the United States. Um, and that's you know, pretty much you know, how it, it ends. This is a photograph here of a, a dear friend of mine who died in 2018, um, uh, Helen Tischauer, who was the Slovakian woman who died in New York, actually, on East 33rd Street. Um, in, her, in her apartment um, and lived out her life there. And her husband is pictured here in this photograph in her bed. Uh, he was also a survivor, a Berlin Jew. Um, and she helped historians for decades, um, help us to understand this history, um, help us understand the history of, of her family. Um, and I just wanted, Helen Tischauer, I just wanted to mention her because, um, because she's a New Yorker and she's just, she was a really important survivor. Uh, and we wrote a book about her that I encourage you to pick up a whole group of historians pay tribute to her and it's called Approaching an Auschwitz Survivor. Um, and she was featured in the New York Times um, recently. So um, Helen Tischauer, Zippy, her nickname was, um, uh, you can look her up and, and I hope that you find her story useful in your teaching as well. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, you know, I know this is very difficult history, but I hope this gives teachers a better understanding of, you know, the Holocaust in its entirety um, and what really happened. Um, so moving on to some questions. Um, you mentioned uh, Babi Yar, um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, the evolution of that site, what happened to it? Yeah. So um, what happens is that the Red Army comes in, they're, they're aware that this was used as a major killing site, but the Soviets, um, um, they have their own ideology and their own campaign of anti-Semitism that Stalin is starting to embark on immediately after the war. And um, because he died basically in 1953, Stalin, that campaign was not carried out, but already started to go after the so-called believe that Jewish doctors, there was a plot to kill him and he became paranoid and everything. But um, while the, this Jewish survivors, especially in the Red Army were collecting testimony and trying to document this, um, the Soviets themselves did not want to draw a lot of attention to the uniqueness of the Holocaust. They said all peaceful Soviet citizens died and they wanted to um, kind of diminish that, um, spe the specificity of, of Hitler's anti-Semitism. And in large part, because they did not want to talk about their own Soviet citizens' anti-Semitism, that they participated as collaborators, that they had taken this property, that they had participated in these pogroms. Um, so that was something that they did not want to draw attention to, the behavior of their own um, citizens. 
And so they also engaged and they continued the cover up uh, that the Nazis started in a site like Ukraine. They completely filled in that ravine. It had been dynamited by the Germans, but they really finished it off as far as evening it out um, and, um, and covering it up um, and turned it into a park. Now, what happened was um, uh, there was a brick factory and other um, industrial uh, uh, facilities near that site. Um, and um, there, they, the waste from that factory was, was spilling into that area. And there was a natural disaster of mudslides that were um, kind of precipitated by this industrial waste. So we have this environmental history here that's really interesting. Um, comes down into that terrain and opens up what had been covered up, including the human remains and the clothing, and pushes that debris into the city, into Kiev proper. Um, and this is in the 60s, and the Soviets cover this up like they tried to cover up um, some of the impact of the Chernobyl disaster in the 80s. And so it's an outrage among the local in the local population when they're coming across all these remains. Um, and this then starts, a, does inspire people like Yevtushenko and, and Soviet intellectuals writing the poem Babi Yar, writing the novel Babi Yar to speak out about what happened um, to the Jews there and start to memorialize that. But it's not until after the collapse of the Soviet Union that a memorial to the Jews specifically is erected at Babi Yar. And now they are pursuing a much more um, comprehensive museum memorial site with the history of Jewish life in Ukraine and a lot of interesting innovative design techniques. It's some have some agree with it, some don't, but it's what the Ukrainians want to do and they're taking it on and it's started as a grassroots movement and it's um, you know been funded by uh, a combination of, of, of folks. Um, so that's um, something you can look up in the newspapers, but um, but now 80 years on, we're finally kind of getting um, the, the Jewish part of this story, which is so important um, on record and in the, um, in the community, in the international community, in the capital of, of Ukraine. Uh, and the, I, I think the designs are, are really impressive um, and the commitment is there. And I think it's, we have to support it. I mean, what's the alternative? Look at what's going on in Poland and in Hungary. Um, and I think that there's a lot of pressure um, for uh, Ukrainians to, potentially pursue that, the path that we're seeing in Poland, Ukraine, and Hungary as far as suppression of collaboration, suppression of this history, um, and they're choosing another path. So I think that we should support that. Thank you. Um, so another question, um, do you have any examples or um, stories of survivors of these massacres? Um, I know you mentioned Helen, but if, if you have any other examples. Uh, yes, actually, you can find a really good video. One of the best um, audiovisual testimonies. It's hours long, uh, so I wouldn't ask you to to go through that. Although, though, if you have the opportunity, you should. Um, her name is Blechman, um, Ludmilla, uh, B L E K H M A N, uh, Ludmilla Blechman. And Ludmilla survived the, the photo that I showed you from Mirapol, Ukraine. Mirapol was Ludmilla's hometown. And Yad Vashem um, posted um, a synopsis of her testimony with English subtitles, because she gave it in Russian. Um, and it's really uh, an important testimony. She, again, was a kind of sole survivor. She actually crawled out of that pit and went on this whole odyssey of uh, with a, uh, tried to pose as a, a Ukrainian peasant girl, was captured, interrogated, was, you know, went into hiding, was then denounced, and was just on the run. Was was in this. Thank you for putting that in there. Was in this, like in a living for a while in like a pool of water under a bridge. Just like her survival story is just unbelievable. Um, and she actually. Um, uh, participated in the trial against those Ukrainians who were pictured in that image, those policemen, they were found, they were hunted down and found and convicted and, and executed. There was justice there in the late 80s, it was very late, um, right before Ukraine got its independence. And Ludmilla um, attended that trial and participated in that trial and saw that justice for her family. 
Um, and I, I'll just, I featured her story and this photograph in my book, The Ravine. So it's a, it's a compact book. I deliberately wrote a book, uh, kind of micro study that um, for graduate students and teachers to understand the, the various sources you can use and how you can piece the history together and um, in visual way with artifacts, looking at the landscape. But I try to make it a very compact book so that people, I know you're busy, <laughs> can sit down and you know, get that story down and how it's put together and some of the key questions and, and hopefully that will help you. And Ludmilla is featured in, in, that, in that book. So I usually don't push my own work, but I'm, I created the book to try to help, uh, help teachers and students, so. Thank you. Um, so another question, um, have there been many witnesses to massacres who have come forward and spoken about what they saw? Uh, absolutely. In the PowerPoint presentation, I had a YouTube link um, to a survivor. Um, there's so many incredible accounts you can draw from as far as the survivors. Abraham Suits Caver. Hey, Abraham Suits Caver um, was uh, uh, um, a poet, you know. So you you also have the Lurie um, images. You know, how do you convey? what it meant to experience this history, what was survival, um, what carried on after the war, what was the aftermath of that? How did survivors bear witness on behalf of their families and communities and try to deal with this history um, and the resonance of it? And Suits Kaver was um, this Yiddish poet in Lithuania in the Vilna ghetto. Um, and he wrote this poem in January, 1943. He was working, his own family had been deported um, and, and gassed and, or shot rather, and, and their clothing and shoes came back from that site. He was sorting through them and he found um, his mother's shoes. And on that occasion, he wrote this poem and it's in my book. And I uh, usually read from it. I find it very helpful with students to read from that poem because it brings out the individuality of the victims. And it's of the moment from 1943, where he talks about the empty boots and the slippers and pumps and who wore these poems. And there's my mother's Sabbath pair. Um, and they're, you know, representing Jewish life through these shoes. And I, I think that's a helpful, helpful device as far as um, we see shoes in the memorials and people wonder about them. In the photograph I showed you from Mirapol, those shoes are in the foreground. So it's a way to uh, approach the uh, individuality of those Jews who died and of, of Jewish life. And Suits Kaver actually testified, he survived. The Soviets helped kind of rescue him. They wanted him, him to survive. He was such a, a powerful speaker and uh, intellectual uh, talent. So they like um, brought him to the Nuremberg trials and on this like 69th day of the trial, he stood up, he was the first in the courtroom to really tell the story of what happened in Lithuania and de describe in detail what the Germans did. They're, if the escalate, you know, forms of persecution. And it's a very, it's about four minutes. So it's Kaver, you have, can have his poetry there and you can play that video clip of him in the Nuremberg trial, standing there, um, trying to keep his composure, speaking, you know, very factually, but it, it clearly um, with difficulty. And then you show that the, the camera shows those Nazi perpetrators, the highest ranking perpetrators, Goering, the people who were left, the biggest fish, and they're listening to that. You can see the way they're reacting to it. Some are looking down the paper, some are really listening. So uh, that's also, I think, a good um, uh, bit of, of footage to show. And of course, his story, Suits Caver's story, and his poetry, and those shoes, um, I think, are another way to, to teach this chapter. Thank you. Um, so another question is, um, you know, how how available was information at this time? You know, were any communities aware of these mobile killing units and what was happening? Um, specifically, were the Jewish communities um, able to learn about this in any way? Mm. Yeah. Um, so we do know that a couple things. First of all, um, unlike um, our experience with war, where we sent our men overseas, um, the German forces, this was uh, a continental campaign, and there was circulating back and forth from the, these battle zones and even these 
genocide zones, you know, the, the killing on the front as well as immediately in these communities behind the lines. And they were going back and forth, you know, on leave. Um, they didn't just go overseas and stay for a few years and write letters. And it was like filtered through letters or the censors caught their letters and confiscated their letters. So there was this information flow. And of course there were rumors, but even before, I mean, I showed you that picture of that nurse, um, one of the nurses that I interviewed who ended up in Ukraine and she arrived in November 41, right? So she arrives on the scene and immediately sees and is, knows what's going on. But even before she arrived, she was in Berlin and her friend who was a journalist in Berlin, she's a, a, a German woman. And she tells her friend, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being um, sent to Ukraine uh, as a nurse. Um, and he said, you know, watch out, Annetta. Um, you know, they're shooting all the Jews. Um, so uh, already the information is circulating among the Germans um, very close to, you know, the time. Um, and as I mentioned, the British had intercepted reports uh, in late August 1941. And British intelligence analysts um, had already concluded at the end of August 41 that there was a systematic campaign to exterminate Jews specifically. And Churchill was aware of that as well. When the Babi Yar massacre occurred um, uh, shortly thereafter, we have in the diary of Klemperer, he's a Jewish man who's married to a German woman in Dresden, and he's in hiding and he's writing in his diary that he's hearing about these um, mass shootings outside of Kiev. So the information for people who are, you know, willing to look into it, who are listening, who are paying attention, you know, can, they can piece it together. But most people um, just didn't want to, even Jews just didn't want to believe this. It's, it's about not only, it's about comprehension and, um, and disbelief and, and uh, the kind of absorption of that, the, the realization of that. Um, so the information was there, but not everybody really wanted to comprehend what was happening. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a few strategies to talk about this type of history with students. Um, you know, it's obviously a very painful history. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about other strategies to introduce this type of history to students. Mm. Yeah, um, well, at first I think it's um, students, it, when you show a lot of violent images or tell stories about violence, you can't leave it at that, obviously. Um, it doesn't explain um, how these things happen. Um, and it could just, you know, they'll just, the, the focus will kind of ruminate on those, on those haunting images, on those disturbing images. And it all has to be presented, you know, within this context. Now, of course, you know, depending on the age of your students, I wouldn't present them with the nudity of the victims you know, which might elicit a kind of um, pornography, a kind of sexual, the sexualized images, especially the boys with the girls, with the, with the women. And I mean, we know this, and at the museum in Washington, for instance, they have, they, they have shields that they put up and they recommend that 11 and young years old and younger really shouldn't be exposed to these kind of images. So you, the, I teach college students, um, but you're dealing with the younger group. So you, you know best what, um, what, how you should um, uh, convey this in an appropriate manner as far as um, uh, cognitively where they are and emotionally, um, the younger ones. So I think if you explain it as stories, um, um, first, this, what I, how I started with the ideology and what the, what the campaign, the intentions were and the ideas were that to try to, try to um, uh, introduce them to different ideas that are about lack of toleration and xenophobia and hate kind of hateful ideas that um, that can become part of a state ideology and that ordinary people will respond to that 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 happens and that's the, the kind of the context um, that wasn't just this kind of unbridled unfettered violence but there was this plan because that's what distinguishes it and makes it genocidal and makes it the holocaust and then yes and to um show, you know, talk about the individual portraits of, of pick out perpetrators, um, uh, maybe their biographies who, who were in the Einsatzgruppen um, uh, and maybe how did they get to that point? Or I have, you know, biographies in my work on women um, 
because uh, it's not all about men, it's uh, men in uniform, but this is a social history as well. You saw the picture of the, the youth, you know, and the, and the boys, the Hitler youth, part of this colonization experiment. Um, uh, and the stories, the individual biographies of the survivors, um, uh, which we have in, in different form, um, the artwork that we saw, how do they express, you know, what happened to them, what happened to their family members, um, uh, to individualize it. And also, as I uh, suggested, to also think about family uh, as a unit of, 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 as a victim unit. Um, and I use, I have, a, you know, German reports, um, the one that I showed you with the numbers, um, it's not, overtly graphic, but when you sit down with a student and say, this is what, this is how they did this, um, uh, and all these different victim groups and explain why did they go after the, the mentally and physically disabled, and they were also on that list, I, sh I didn't point out, it said gypsies, Zagoyner, um, why were, you know, they specifically pointing out the women and, and children. Um, I have another report that I often use, um, that uh, uh, is also featured in, in the book, The Ravine, um, about a family that Germans found in hiding in 1943. And it's just a brief little report that says that this family of three men, two women and three children had been hiding in a hole in a field um, and that the police, the German police had been tipped off by a local. Um, and then the German police officials, just a little report um, just to show the bureaucratic nature of this and then the thoroughness of it. Um, in this little village, he says these Jews were flushed out of a well camouflaged hole and they were shot while trying to escape and their tattered clothes were given to the local villagers. Um, there's a lot you can do with that. I mean, they, they were on the run. Their clothes were given to local villagers. They had been denounced by the local villagers. They'd been there for over a year. You know, that was what it took to survive. They were this, this family unit, three men, two women, and and two, three children, what was, what was that um, uh, grouping? Um, and, and imagine that. Or the Suits Caver uh, work that I referred to, um, where you combine the story of an individual survivor with the richness of his poetry and, and how that comes across. Aaron Applefeld's work is also really, um, is, is important too, to, to bring in. I... A lot of material you can use for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. Um, we are out of time, um, but you know, it was such a, I think really powerful presentation and I hope it gives the teachers more context for this history, this lesser known history, especially. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Lauer. Um, and thank you to, for the teachers for joining us. Um, our final session of the day will begin at 12.30 p.m. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Look thank at all you. this great information in the chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Have everyone. A Have a great Bye -bye. day. Have a great day.